I know it. All right, we're good. Live. <laughs> All right. Y'all don't be saying anything. Well, hello to everybody that's watching, and uh, hopefully you're, yeah, Sunday night again, and it's ready to go, and uh, we're sitting here talking about the hurricane, everything going on with the hurricane, and so I'm, we're praying for everybody that's trying to recover, those that are moving away. We have, we have quite a few people in Gulfport that are here from the storm. A lot of, uh, Billy said a lot of the campgrounds and some of the areas like that. Motel stuff full, yeah. Yeah, man, that's something. It's, uh, I was reading, I was looking at the graphic before we came on the Weather Channel, and they said that there were 18.1 million people that were displaced from Florida in some way or another, you know. And some of them are probably still in Florida. They're just in uh, centers where, uh, evacuation centers and stuff like that rather than their homes. But, uh, yeah, six million without power. And so, anyway, all of our guys are, are there. So, our, I think our, uh, you know, I was just telling you this morning that Justin was gone. Uh, our power company is, is staged over there, and I think they're going to be in Georgia. They're in Macon, Georgia, so... You know, it's going all the way on up, so everything's um, going to be about. That's that's no, no. That's that's Tanya and them trying to make everything aesthetic here or something or another. I'm washed out. Well, I mean, I do need to see. You do know that, right? <laughs> I mean, it's that it's that essence. It's that glory of God. That's what it is. It's the glory, yeah. You know, somebody said, oh, about your head No, that's the glory of God shining off of me. That's after the oil comes out of my mouth. And I, yeah, <laughs> holy man, you know, I'm telling you, yeah. <laughs> Listen, Bill, don't be saying, I don't want you to say a word now. Don't you be, don't you say, don't you say a word. <laughs> don't say a word. Well, I guess y'all all, uh, you got your, you, did you study your, you study your stuff. You know, I was, it's been a while since we've done uh, uh, this second, the second what, what we used to call the second term. We had four terms, and this was the second one. Um, and it's been a while since we've done this one. This one has probably been, uh, we've, done, we, we've done the spiritual gifts, which is number three. Of course, it doesn't really matter what order you take them in because they don't, they don't build on each other. They're all separate. Um, and they all are, uh, you know, they'll, they'll, uh, you don't, you don't have to have one to go to the next because it's not, uh, they don't, they don't correlate like that. They're all separate um, identities for, for what they're about. But um, this one was the second one. It's just been a while, and it's probably because uh, we've been, you know, we've been carrying people through the experience in God, which is uh, the first one, which is really uh, very basic and and tremendous. Um, about your about how to walk with God and how to sense God, how to know what He wants you to do, how to know how to how to tell that He's there, how to experience Him. It's uh, Henry Blackaby wrote uh, a series during the '90s called "Experiencing God," the seven principles of experiencing God, and it was uh, it was 26 weeks long. So that tells you that's half a year, you know, and. By the time you got through a half a year, it was like so redundant and so you had to go. I mean, it's only seven principles. So you figure an hour and a half a week or more for 26 weeks. I mean, how many, how many times are you going to go over the same stuff over and over and over and over again? But so it was real, it was, you know, redundant, but it was intended to be that way because it was to try to make sure that you got it. And I went through it. Oh, probably six or eight times uh, before I rewrote everything and uh, and wrote it down to, to like like seven or eight weeks instead of twenty six weeks. And now they they have it. I mean, I'm not claiming any credit. Believe me. I mean, they had all we did when we when we rewrote the things. Uh, we did contact Blackaby personally and ask him if it would be okay because it's copyrighted material and so forth, if we just, for our own use, for our own use, just made it a concise, uh, and he said, yeah, do whatever you want to to it. 
And um, of course, you know, we weren't going to try to sell it or anything or do anything with it other than just personally use it. But now I know that they even in store in the bookstores now you can get his his material that they've done that way with. I think they've gotten it. I don't know, 12 weeks or something like that. But anyway, the point is that uh, we did we do that one uh, quite often because it's just really essential. It, it's just really super. And even if you've been through it more than once, it still it still is so good because it's just such a truth of life that that most people don't really have an experience with God, really. I mean, they, they do. They know the Lord, and they're Christians, and they, and they love God, and they come to church, and they want, to, you know, they want their life to reflect the Lord. But they don't really have a personal relationship because they don't know how to evaluate it. They, they have, I mean, they want it. It's not like, you know, they're trying to be hypocrites or something like that. I mean, they really want it, and they've made the commitment, but because they don't know how to see God in their regular life, in their everyday life, they miss their experience with God all the time. So, therefore, they're not encouraged by that. So, they don't, um, they don't have the enthusiasm and the joy of of sensing a very real close presence with God all the time, and they don't know how to evaluate what happens in their life, so they don't, they don't see God working every day with them and different things, and they miss a lot of the, the neat little things that God does that are really encouraging to you, and it gets you excited about things, you know. Because I guarantee you one of the things that, uh, that I, can, I can assure you is if you feel like, you heard God, and you feel like you did what God wanted you to do, and he used you, you will never quit talking about it. I'll guarantee you, you will, you will know. I mean, and every time somebody <laughs> gives you a chance to testify, yeah. that'll be the first thing I do. Man, I won't tell you what God did. Oh, it was all amazing, Pastor. And you'll just testify to that because it's so impressive to you, and it's so soul uh, inspiring to you that you just won't ever forget it. And that's the daily experience with Christ. I mean, that's what, that's what the, the walk with Christ is supposed to be about every day is though, are those kind of experiences, you know, where you really sense his leadership, you obey it, and then you, he uses you, and then it encourages you, and, and it, it moves you forward. I, I mean, I know it, it, uh, there are a lot of people that never have that sense, and so it's no wonder that they're you know, their life's kind of flat with Christ. You know, I mean, they, they want to go to heaven when they die and they, they pray about things, you know, and they try to teach their children and stuff. But it, they just really live almost an uninspired type life because they just don't know how to see God work. They pray and then they don't know when God answers a prayer, you know, or something. And so it's just, it's just, a, it's just an existence that, that could be so much better. If, if you could just see these things. And so what term one is, is how do you see them? You know, what does it look like? How would I recognize it? Uh, what would I need to do to have this? And it's just really, really good. And then this one is the second one uh, where we go into these five big areas of life, big old ones, like our mind. We spent, what, three or four weeks talking about the, the things the Scripture says about the kind of mind we're supposed to have with Christ. Um, and now we're on the mouth, and then we'll go to the money, and then we'll go to the uh, to the marriage or relationships, which that's a really big deal. And then, because uh, all of us have relationships, and all of us want relationships, and those relationships either make us bitter or better, you know, <laughs> and uh, they have a lot of effect on our lives, and so. That's really an important issue, and the Scripture's full of information, and it says a lot of things about our relationships and so forth. And if you don't pay attention to those, it's to your own detriment, and it's to your own demise, because nothing so enhances you toward God as a great relationship with somebody who's pursuing God themselves, and nothing so hinders you as a relationship with somebody who doesn't have a relationship with God or doesn't care about a relationship with God or is is harmful to your, to your pursuit of God in some way. It's very tough to fight through that. And so 
that that's part of this and then your ministry because we all do have a ministry uh, it may be to the people we live with it may be to the people we work with it may be to both of those it may be to the people around us uh, but we have a ministry I mean, I, I, just because you're not up here preaching a sermon or sitting on a stool teaching a lesson or singing or, you know, working with kids or whatever it might be doesn't mean you don't have a ministry. You have a ministry because somebody, somebody respects you. Somebody admires you. I know you're thinking, no, they don't. Well, yes, they do. Somebody admires you. Have, you have someone who's paying attention to you, who watches you, who thinks about you and would like to be like you or you have some kind of sway in their life in some way, and those are the people that you have a ministry to. Those are the people that you can impact with the, with the gospel, with the kingdom, with your life, with the, the essence of true Christianity and reality and so forth. And what you teach them is what they, they, you know, they grow to be. And so it's very important that you are aware of this and that you use those opportunities to be a minister uh, at wherever you are, because really, many of those people that look to you as somebody that they respect or somebody that they pay attention to and they want to be like, or in some way they're uh, they're influenced by you, they might not be influenced by me because they don't know me. They don't, you know, they don't have any relationship. They don't really, you know, I, I if I say something to them, well, that's what preachers are supposed to say. So, you know, I mean, so that that kind of goes in one ear and out the other because they don't have any respect for whatever or they don't know who I am or anything like that. So it's not, I mean, I'm not going to have the influence over them that you do. And I know that's scary, you know. I mean, you're probably looking at it, you know. I mean, to think of that, that you're going to be somebody's minister, oh, my goodness, you know, that's kind of a, I push you on a level there where you got to, where you're saying to yourself, boy, I better pay attention to what I'm doing here because mm, somebody's watching me, I, I don't want to lead them wrong, you know, and, and, and discourage them rather than encourage them. So anyway, we have that. And then the third is, uh, your, are your, uh, is material on your spiritual gifts. And uh, there's so much craziness taught about the spiritual gifts. It's unbelievable. I think probably of all the areas in the Christian life, the most ridiculous stuff in the world is taught concerning the gifts. It's just, I mean, there's so many crazinesses. But really, um, to, the, I think the, probably the thing that's the most common is just the concept of giftedness in the spiritual life revolves around magic. Um, it, it's mystical. It, it, because this, the Bible doesn't say a whole lot about the gifts. It does, it does mention them. Ephesians talks about the gift of the gifted person. You know, he gave us pastors. He gave us prophets. He gave us evangelists. He gave us teachers. Um, he gave us apostles for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, so that we would all be equipped unto every good work. Well, that's one place in Ephesians 5. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it talks about all these gifts and it names like speaking in tongues, interpretations of tongues, healings, uh, miracles. It names just, just a whole group of names. And it, that whole 12th chapter is full of different varieties of administrations and functions of gifts. And he just mentions, he just kind of like throws out a bunch of different, you know, kinds of ministries that the Holy Spirit does in people. And so people just go wild trying to imagine what that is and trying to tell you what it's, you know, what it would be. And, and they just, you know, just, it's just like, you know, uh, fantasy land or something or another. And then in Romans chapter 12, there are seven of them that are listed that, um, that he says, if these, if, if one of these is you, then do that to the greatest of your ability to do it. And, and it appears that the ones in Romans 12 are different than the ones in 1 Corinthians 12. And of course, all of them are different from the ones in Ephesians 5. So you're left to, to say to yourself, what in the world would my gift? And then, of course, you listen to the preachers on TV and you listen to preachers on the internet. You listen to the, pre you know, you listen to the preacher and, and you listen to the latest evangelist that pops through with some theory about gifts and stuff like that, and it all boils down to 
pretty much um, magic, you know. Uh, this is just uh, something that God uses, and he gives it to you, and then you uh, do it like this. And they, dim, they, they, what they do with their ministry is just bizarre. It's just wacko. And, and you, you're left thinking, what in the world kind of stuff is this? And then you start feeling guilty because you don't ever demonstrate anything like that. And the, the sad reality is neither do they, but they pretend, and everybody goes, woo hoo you know. Well, that's not what God intends for gifts, the gifts to be. And they're not all alike, and they're not all the same, and they don't function the same way, and they're not even talking about the same thing. So anyway, all of that is in the third term. It's, it's there, and you can see what you are. You can see what people around you are. You can see what your children are. You can, I mean, it's really eye-opening. And it's really good. And then the fourth one is um, how to keep growing, how to, how to uh, be challenged to keep moving forward for Christ, how to know what God wants you to do, how to know what your purpose is, how to know if you're doing what God's called you to do and what he's created you for and how you can know what it is and how you can keep on doing it and how you can keep on growing all through your life and keep moving forward and keep being challenged and everything. And so that's, pretty, that's the four different uh, schools of lead our journey classes. And uh, so if you hadn't been to all of them, I encourage you to do that. And even if you have, I think Bev and Lawrence have been through, you've been through all of these about five or six times, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> they've, been through, they've been through them all about five or six times. Matter of fact, they could probably teach all of these. And, uh, and uh, they're different every time, though, really. Yeah. I mean, the, prin the principle's the same, but, you know, it just kind of fluctuates based on who's in here and what the Lord wants to say to your heart, really. Is what it I know I sit up here and ramble all the time, but, um, but really, <laughs> we don't need anything from the bees back there, but they, uh, <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> no, but I go, no. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but it, it, it evidently the Holy Spirit has a, a, a method to the madness, you know. Well, now, B. You know, on that, uh, talking about relationships, to me, one of the lolly court verses that John 3 16 tells me really what I mean. Yep. Right. And, and it's so funny because for God so loved the world mm -hmm. right. that he did the same. He gave his son for every one, each, each individual. Right. And so your relationship with God depends on you. Right. He's there and he's ready. Right. And you can make it what you want. You know? Right. And to me, that's the bottom line, and that's kind of cut and dry. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and so the only thing that um, affects that is, all right, what do I do? I mean, how do I respond to this? And what is my life about based on the fact that he loves me? And he, the door is never closed on his side. It's always open on his side. So when you go to the, the Lord, the door is never locked on his side. It's always open. So you walk through, and the Scripture tells us how to do that and how to you know, the, the Bible says of itself that the man of God should be thoroughly furnished, is the old King James word, unto every good work. In other words, God's given you the tools to, to use so that you can walk with God and know God and please God and be used by God. Uh, and the word is filled with it. And so here's how you do this. And so people like me and, and others who uh, have a call from the Lord to try to expose these things, that's what our whole ministry is about. You know, it's about how, to, how do we do that and uh, how, practically, in practical ways, what would we need to do? How would we do this? And how would we know we're doing it and doing it right? So anyway, hopefully that's what it'll be. Okay, so let's move into what we got. You, you guys uh, ready it's with the mouth? Oh, no. You know, I think out of, prob out of all the ones... Out of all the things in our life that uh, affect our movement and walk with God and our life that we live every day, this one has to be the most challenging. 
It really does because something can be done in a moment with our mouth that'll last forever, really. It's just so difficult to get hold of our, of our mouth because, it, it, you know, we can have things going really well in our relationship with the Lord and our focus on Him and, and, and what our heart wants and, and we can be inspired and we can be committed. And then, and, and then in a moment's time, our mouth can fly out with something that can, that can just change the course of, of, of life. And it's so, it, it, this little booger right here, <laughs> booger right there, good night. It's tiny, but it's tough. You know, it is. It's just ridiculously easy to mess up with, with your mouth. And I think that's one reason why it's really so important on, on these 10 statements, 10 laws of the, of the mouth. You know, that's amazing. Now, the first one, the first law, and remember what we do, and for those that are watching um, online and don't have the manual that we, that we have, that we've done, uh, you guys aren't aware of what, of what is in there. But the first law in the law of your mouth is the law of the tongue. Now, it's there first because you really you have to grasp this before any of the rest of these will really matter to you at all. And the book of James talks about the law of the tongue. And it tells you about how vital it is for you to understand the power of this tiny little, you know, what, four or five inch organ right here in your mouth, uh, muscle right there. And the fact that God keeps it hidden, you know, I mean, he keeps it behind these ivory bars and bathes it in this solution so it won't, you know, get out of control here. And he, and he keeps it, you know, concealed so nobody can see it. Nobody walks around and say, hey, look, uh-huh, uh-huh. No, I mean, it's, it, it does that, I think, because uh, it, it, it's so difficult to control the little fella. And, and here's what it says, and I know you, you have your scripture sheet that's in your notes. Of course, you can turn in your Bible if you want to look at James chapter 3. But let me just, let me just read the passage, uh, just a few verses in the passage that, that kind of get us going. All right, uh, this is James chapter 3, beginning at verse 4. Look also at ships. So he's going, he's going to give us some analogies now. He's going to say, all right, here's what your tongue is like. He said, okay, your, son, your tongue all right, is like a ship, but, but he's going to say not the whole ship. It's just going to be the rudder. So, so you can kind of get a visual that in comparison to a ship, you know, the rudder's tiny. The rudder is the little part that steers the ship. It's that little, little part that's under the water. You can't see it. You know, but it, if, if the pilot turns the rudder one way, it makes the whole ship go the way the pilot wants it to go. Okay, so it compares. He says, think about your tongue like you would the rudder in a ship. All right, so, and then he compares it to some other things we'll read. Look also at ships. Uh, Though they are so large and driven by fierce winds, they're turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member but boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. So the tongue is like a rudder on a ship, tiny but very powerful, under, under the water, so nobody sees it, but it just it, it moves the whole ship wherever the, the pilot, wherever the captain wants it to go. And then he says, okay, it's, like a, it's also like a fire. And think about how little bit of fire it takes to, to burn down an entire forest. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity, a world of, of sin, rebellion, uh, twisting, distorting. Iniquity means to 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 twist out of shape. That's what the word iniquity, you know, a lot of words for sin. The Bible uses a lot of different words for sin. This one means to be distorted, um, to be twisted out of, out of shape. I told you before, I've given you the illustration about when I was a young pastor and we had the little spot space heater in the church and we had some plastic flowers on top of it and they were beautiful. And then one Sunday, one Saturday night, it was cold and I went and lit the 
went lit the little space heater before uh, church the next morning, put it on low so it'd be warm in the building when we got there. Well, when we got there the next morning, the, 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 all the plastic flowers were all just running, melted down the heater, and you know, just uh, and that's iniquity. That's what the word iniquity means to twist or distort. Now they they didn't look like plastic beautiful flowers anymore. They were a blob of plastic mess, goop running down. That's what iniquity means. That's what the devil wants to do to our life, to make to distort us out of the shape that Christ has put us in and wants us to be in. So the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by hell, which is a very drastic statement, really, you know. So that's why it's so difficult to control because it's so easy for the devil to have control over our tongue and, 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 and us not even realize. That's why we have to keep it under control because, goodness, man, it can just get out of shape so quick. And one little spark can really just set the world on fire. And you know this is true because you've, you've had it happen in your life some, right? For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It is, it is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. So now the tongue has been compared to a ship and a rudder on a ship. The tongue has been compared to fire where you have a little spark that can set the world on fire. Now, James says, the tongue is like a poison where you got a, just a little bit of poison can really, you know, uh, what is it? The most deadly poison in the world is uh, botulin toxin, I think, and that's the kind of uh, poison that they tried to use in Tokyo. You remember years ago, the, those terrorists in Tokyo had that botulin toxin where one gram of it would kill over a million people. And they had it in these aerosol cans, and they went in that subway in Japan, and they sprayed that stuff. And the only bad part for them, good part for everybody else, was the, the strain of botulin they had was, was not potent. It was not the right kind. So when they sprayed it, it didn't kill everybody. But it, it could, if it would have been the right strain, just that little spray would have killed everybody in the whole subway, just that tiny little bit. So poison can be very, very potent, and a little tiny bit of it can, can cause great destruction. So the tongue's been compared to, to a rudder on a ship that is tiny but just sets the thing in motion, a fire like... Uh, uh, and I gave you in, in your notes, we gave you in your notes, the, uh, the Chicago fire in 1871, Miss O'Leary's cow kicked over the thing. You know, they've, they've come to the conclusion that that's not really what happened at all. That's just one of those wives' tales about stuff. I can't remember exactly now, just off the top of my head, what they say really happened. I don't know if it was a lightning strike or a something, but they, the historians say that Miss O'Leary's cow stuff is a bunch of bull <laughs> no, no, no pun intended. <laughs> no pun intended. I really didn't. But, but that that didn't. Re but, but the point is that the fire did put uh, millions of people um, out of light. You know, uh, destroyed a hundred thousand homes, uh, seventeen thousand five hundred buildings, and killed uh, three hundred and cost four hundred million dollars. So, just a little tiny spark set that place on fire and did all that damage. And so, it was very small, but it just got out of hand really, really fast. Uh, no man can tame the tongue. It's full of uh, unruly evil, full of deadly poison. And here's verse 9. With it, we bless our God and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not be so... Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? So now it's com the tongue's compared to a fountain that would have fresh water coming out of it and also salt water coming out of it. So it shows you the, uh, the conflict of the tongue that sometimes it can say great things, encouraging things, nice things, uh, uplifting things and then turn right around and the next minute be saying things that are negative 
and harmful and hurtful and deadly and poisonous and all of that. And he says, so my brethren, these things should not be. In verse 12, can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus, no spring yields both salt water and fresh. So James is talking to us about the tongue and the first law of our mouth is the law of our tongue. And it, and it just basically says, look, you need to understand that the tongue is an instrument that God has given you that is intended to be beneficial in life. But if we don't do everything possible to keep this little tiny member of our body under control, it's going to get out of hand quickly. And when it gets out of hand, it's going to do tremendous damage in just a moment. I mean, it's going to just fire off. I mean, think about it. Um, a rudder on a ship is great because without it, you couldn't tell where it's going. But if you don't direct it in the right way, it becomes a very negative thing very quickly. Uh, poison. Poison is tremendously useful in life. All of our cancer drugs are just poison. And, and, and we just poison our body a little bit at a time to kill cells in there that are causing damage to the body. But if you don't control that poison, then that poison's going to kill the body because it's just running wild. So poison is a good thing as long as it's under control, but when it gets out of control, it becomes a killer. Uh, fire. Fire is a wonderful thing. Fire is a tremendous tool, a great gift. Think about what our world would be like if, there, if, if, if fire was not a part of, of the existence. And I mean, think what, what has been accomplished through the fact that we can use fire as a tool to cook things and to warm things and to forge things. I mean, think what would, what would the world would be like if fire was not a tool that had been discovered to be able to be used, but out of control, a fire becomes you know, tremendously dangerous in life. And think about, and think about water. You know, water is, is a tremendous tool. Like out of a fountain, water's, I mean, water, you, you drink with it. It's used to produce, you know, hydroelectric power. It's, uh, it's something to bathe with, something to um, uh, cool you down. I mean, there are lots of tremendously wonderful uses of water, but water out of control becomes a tremendously dangerous force and becomes a destroyer, like with all these floods and, and, and you get too much water and not in the wrong places or it gets out of control or it breaks through the dam or it does whatever. And, and now the water that is a wonderful tool and a wonderful blessing, even when it's out of control, it becomes a tremendous weapon that's used and terrible and it's very destructive. And see, I mean, that's what James is telling us about the tongue that we need to understand this about our tongue. And when we pray and when we contemplate our life, that one of the things that we need to grasp is, as children of God and as instruments of the Holy Spirit and as someone who is, we're walking with God and we're wanting to be used by God and we're wanting to bless our people and our children and our families, that we, we must understand the duality of this little tiny organ in our mouth and pray and ask God, God, before we pop up and pop off and pop out something that's going to kill somebody, Lord, you know, spark me with the Holy Spirit so I don't do these foolish things with my tongue because... You know, a world of damage can be done in a moment of time. Just in a flicker of a moment, you can destroy what you've spent years trying to develop and trying to move forward in somebody's life. So understand that this little deal right here is one of the most powerful influences in your whole being. 
and and don't take it you know lightly. Don't 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 let your guard down with your tongue because if you do, uh, the devil's going to jump up there and produce something that you don't want produced. You're going to say something to somebody. You're going to you're going to let this get out of control. You're going to open. It. I mean, the Bible. I mean, God gives us two ears and and, and one mouth, <laughs> with the implication being what. Listen twice as much as you talk. But do we do that? No, we talk twice as much as we listen, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, why don't we, you know, one of the most, one of the most often, um, sta- often made statements that I have made to me in marriage counseling is my husband doesn't listen to me. You know why they say that? Because he doesn't listen to them. <laughs> Why don't we listen to others? Not just men, but why don't we listen to others? It's because we love to talk, right? I mean, we, we, we think about how often somebody's saying something to you and you're not listening to what they're saying. You're just waiting for them to be quiet so you can say what you're wanting to say. And you're not listening to what they say. And, and you can tell, have you ever been talking to somebody and you can tell they're not listening to what you're saying? I mean, they're just sitting there waiting for you to quit talking so they can say, and how do you know that? Because when they start talking, it has nothing to do with what you just said. And how disrespectful that is. That you're not even really paying. Do you like to talk to somebody who doesn't care what you say? No, you don't. And neither do I, and neither does anybody else. And so the scripture's just encouraging us to be aware that, that this is a very powerful tool that can, within a moment's time, turn from a tremendous blesser. With it, men bless the Lord. With it, men bless each other. But also with it, curses come forth and, and, and fresh water and salt water come out of the same fountain and this is ridiculous that it would do that, and you, and it and it's something to be something to be understood this way, and realize how powerful this is, and don't take for granted that it's not important how, that you watch what you say with your mouth because it is a tool that can that that is a double-edged sword. It can cut or it can bless, and and be aware of this, and don't think that it's not important what you say to people and how you use this thing. Because uh, it's extremely important. And it's one of the most powerful tools in your arsenal that God has given you. And it's also one of the most powerful weapons that the devil uses against you and the people you love and the people you want to influence. So guard it is what he's Guard this thing well. And uh, the scripture talks quite a bit about it. And we'll... we'll uh, We'll do it, but let me let me ask you a question uh, in 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 your lesson material. If you're looking on page 13, I know you did your homework, and I know you shared some of this thing. But but if you have a, an, an observation, let me let me ask you to do this. Uh, it says share a brief explanation of positive words that others have spoken to you, and God has used in order to steer you in the right direction. Did anybody write anything there about all right? Somebody spoke something positive, and it steered me in the right direction, and it was a great blessing. Did you? All right. Virginia, did you wrote? Somebody said that you were smart, mm-hmm. and somebody said that you gave we them courage, and, the other one was that I was and you were special. Now, how did that how did that affect you when you heard those kind of words? I hear you. Feel good. Well, did it did it give you any direction in life? I mean, did it say, "Hey, look, I know I don't seem this way." Right. So that's how you're being observed. That's how others are thinking about you. And so, even though you may not think that way yourself, that you give people encouraged, or that you or smart, or that you, you know, that you're an inspiration to other people's lives, it's how people see you, and uh, it, yeah, it changed, well, I mean, I can see you're smiling, and your countenance lifted when you started talking about that, 
and it, it takes away from you the, the thought that the devil tries to beat in your mind like you're, you know, you're dumb or you don't matter or that people don't, you know, that you're not what you need to be and all of that, that somebody says that to you is a positive thing in your life. And, see, and that's what we're talking about, you know, that in a moment, I mean, somebody can say one little tiny word. I tell you what my dad said to me one time. My dad said to me, and I can still remember it. I must have been about 14 years old, 13 years old, and we were doing some little project, some little tiny something or another, and, uh, and I was helping my dad, and my dad looked at me and said, Son, you can do anything. And he said that to me. And you know what that said? I said, my daddy thinks that I'm smart. My daddy thinks that I'm capable. My daddy says, I can do anything. And I can't tell you how many times throughout my life after that, when I was in some very critical situations in school and on tests and in doing things in life and in critical moments and in tough moments and anxious times, that little, that little phrase kept ringing back in my mind, you can do anything. You can do anything. My dad said, I can do anything. My dad believes in me. My dad said, I'm good. I'm smart. I'm able. I'm a, you know, and that's what it said to me. And man, it, it pushed me and motivated me and gave me assurance that I could do this, that it wasn't too big for me. One little tiny sentence. You can, son, you can do anything. You see what a little tiny word that is and see how to, what a big impact that made? I mean, I'm sitting here today uh, sharing with you all of these things, uh, a lot due to the fact that that phrase was spoken to me. What if that little tiny phrase was never spoken to me? What if nobody ever said that to me, especially somebody that I respected and admired and I wanted their approval? I mean, imagine that. Imagine how powerful. You see, that's what, that's what James is talking about, about how powerful this tiny little thing is that, that it would matter that much in somebody's life the people that respect you and admire you, when you say something like that to them, one little sentence, man, it just changes the whole course of their life. Like a rudder on a ship, tiny little bitty thing, but just the pilot flexes it this way, and this gigantic big ship of life just moves in that direction rather than the other direction. See, that's the law of the tongue. That's saying that's how powerful this thing is. So be aware of this. I mean, know this. Know that what you say to people has that much of an impact into their life. And things you guys say to me, I mean, I'm, you know, 60, almost 62 years old. We'll be in about four or five months, whatever. I'll be like 62 years old. Been in the ministry a long time. I'm full grown, mature, spiritual, everything else. But you, what you guys say to me sometimes, just one little sentence or one little concept still affects me. You know, I'm your pastor. We're never too old to hear. Yeah, right. Yeah, and it, and, and it moves you. All right, hang on a second. All right, this past Wednesday night, right, Billy said something to you. All right, what did he say to you? Okay, yeah, the young man. I do remember that. So that all of you'll know. Exactly. And when he said that, it, your countenance went up. You're, you, you felt that. You said, I am special. Man, I never thought of myself as being unique and special. And because he made that observation and then he said it. He didn't just think it and keep it to himself. He put it in, he he spit it out there. And when he said that sentence, now think about the tiny little sentence. Well, man, you are special. That one little sentence like that, you are unique. That just, that set on course an aspect of your life that it matters. And whenever the devil's beating you over the head and telling you that you're worthless and you're no good and you're not what you should be, that one little phrase, come, you're, you're special. Man, you're unique. God bless you. That is what the Holy Spirit draws out of your memory 
to hear that sound in your ears of somebody you respect and admire. Yeah, but somebody like Jim who loves you, you know. (laughs) Right, right. And does that matter to you when he says it? I do, yeah, yeah, yeah. So right, so so what he says matters. When it's an observation from somebody who, that you're off mm-hmm. that right, and that they see that in you. Now you see, now now you see how powerful that is, because here's Deborah. She's a full-grown, mature adult who's been through lots of experiences in life, who's lived her life, and yet one little sentence from somebody that she respects and admires made to her about what they observe in her life that is positive in her life. Now, all of a sudden, that's used as a tool by the Holy Spirit to encourage her when the devil is beating her up over a lot of stuff to draw her out of that and say, don't let the devil kill you, man. You're unique. You're special. God's using you. And it's just, see, that's the power of the tongue. That's the law of the tongue. That's, that's what James means when he said this thing's tiny, but it, it, it can set on course just a tiny little something that nobody sees, that nobody thinks about, that nobody observes. It's under the water. Nobody watches it move or do anything. But when it moves, it moves this whole gigantic ship, you know. And, uh, and that's the tongue. And see, realize that. Understand that. And so when you say to yourself, this is, I don't need to say this, you know. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Tell somebody uh, what, the, what the Lord puts in your heart about them. Tell, if they're special, if they're unique, if they're encouraging, if they're, you know, a champion or a hero or what they said, man, that was just that tremendous what you just said to me. It blesses my life. Just don't allow the things to go unsaid that need to be said as an encouragement to others because that matters in people's lives. And that's why God puts it there. Yeah, so that's, that, and see, that just happened this past Wednesday night. I mean, I'm sitting there, I was sitting there listening to it in, in prayer meeting, and I thought to myself when Billy said it, I said, boy, that has to be a real encouragement. And uh, I'm glad to hear that it, that it was, yeah. Yeah, and see, Bill said it. I mean, I'm sure that, you know, he probably thought, well, Deborah's such a great person, and she's sweet, and she's the most helpful person in the world, and, you know, she needs to know that that this is how I feel about what she just said. But he didn't have to say that. He could have just sat there with that in his heart and said, oh, man, she's such a sweet, great person. And he could have just let that slide, and then it would have never been said, and she would have never testified and she would have never been blessed by it, even though that's really the way he felt. And see, that's the power of the tongue. And with it, we bless and we curse. So be careful because it's so easy to curse someone also. Just maybe not even really thinking about how deep this thing would be or how powerful it would be. One gram of botulin toxin will kill a million people. You know, one tiny little you know, will kill everybody, you know, or one tiny little bit can bless everybody. So realize this, it's powerful. All right, does somebody else have something that somebody said? Or? Right. Right. Right, right, and it would be, and for those who, who probably did, may not have heard that, I'm, I'm just kind of repeating a little of it so that the people that are listening can, because they might not be able to hear exactly what you said, but we're talking about uh, the opposite of that, somebody you respect, somebody you admire, saying some tiny little something that could destroy you or could make it negative about you, you know, uh, and that's happened to me before also where somebody's made some kind of comment and it was, it, they, didn't, they didn't maybe even intend for it to be really negative because it was said a little bit out of anger or a little bit out of disrespect 
you know, something happened and they just flared out with some little something and, it, and they didn't realize how negative that was or how much it, you know, maybe insinuated that you were not capable or able or you were dumb or slow or, you know, you're not able to do this or, you know, you're not, you're not able, that kind of thing. How, how destructive that is to your life. There are a lot of people that are in institutions because uh, somebody said some little phrase to them that they didn't realize how impactful that was. I, I, I remember a pastor from Texas telling me, I can't remember how many years ago, but this is just an example of what that's talking about. He, they were, he was in a revival meeting, and a man came up after church, an older man who's like 70 years old or so, and this man had a son that was in a mental institution and this son was 45 or 50 years old, and he was in the institution, and the guy was asking the pastor doing this revival to pray for his son because he was in this institution. And the story was that this son, this, this son was a very brilliant young man, very smart, very capable. His father was an engineer. This was in Texas. His father was an engineer, and the son grew up wanting to follow in his father's footsteps and make his father happy and pleased with him, and so the son said, okay, I'm going to be an engineer, and the son worked hard and tremendous, and he got a he got a scholarship to one of the univer engineering universities in, in Texas, and he told his father, he said, Dad, he said, I got a full scholarship to, to, and he named the school, I can't even remember what it was, in Texas to be an engineer, and here's what his father said. His father said, well, that's great, son, but everybody knows that the best engineers graduate from Georgia Tech or Vanderbilt or whatever it might be. That's what he, sa he said to his son. And, and, and the reason his son was in an institution is because he had tried to commit suicide. I mean, he was, he was a, a, a beautiful young man, uh, just gorgeous, handsome, uh, smart, capable. If you saw him, you would think, well, that's, this is a wonderful person. But if you turned his wrist over like that, you'd find multiple scars on his wrist where he had tried to cut himself and kill himself multiple times because his dad didn't know how to bless his son and not curse his son, and he made a simple little statement. Well, that's great, son, but, you know, everybody knows the best engineers come from blah, blah, blah. What did that say to his son? His son it basically said, well, son, that's great, but you're really not capable. You're really not smart enough. You're really not, you know, and, and, and it had that kind of impact into his life. So it's important. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Oh, is that right? You had someone who no one ever said anything positive to. His dad never approved of anything that he did. Now, he might have approved, but he never said it to him. Right. Yeah. Yep, it's just like somebody, I mean, really, and, and I know this sounds like one of those uh, cartoon analogy kind of deals, but I've, I've actually had people, you know, before, I've done a lot of marriage counseling through, the, through my life and all these years, and, and you'll be surprised. Uh, you hear these kind of uh, stories out there, and you think that, okay, that's just an exaggeration. Nobody's really like that. But I promise you, I've heard testimonies of it, uh, like someone who comes to counseling and their marriage is falling apart. They've been together 35 years, 40 years, something like that. And then all of a sudden, now they want to divorce and they come. And usually it's the wife that comes. Here, here's, this is just kind of one of those little lanyard thoughts. But most of the time, if there's, a, if there's a, a, a degradation of the relationship, the wife comes to me and says, Pastor, can I talk to you about this? Because the relationship is, is what their world revolves around. Men don't generally do that with relationships. They have to be brought in by, by their wife and say, you know, hey, come, you got to come with me or I'm, we're, I'm serving your papers. Then they'll come. And then you ask the guy, you said, man, what happened? He said, I don't know. It just like out of the blue. Well, it's been going on for 40 years. He never has noticed. It was like, it just happened yesterday. No, it didn't. It's been happening for 40 years. You just haven't noticed it until yesterday when somebody brought it up. But, uh, but if you want men to come, let something happen to their job. 
because their whole life revolves around, all right, I am who I am because of what I do for a living. And, of course, then their world caves in. Then they come talk to me about things. Women, it's relationship. Men, it's their job. It's kind of the self-identity thing. But, I, but, but the little cartoon kind of a thought is that I was going to share with you is I have actually had people that have come in and the wife says, he never tells me that he loves me. And his response basically is, I told you that I loved you when, we, when I married you. And if I ever change my mind, I'll let you know. Well, that was 40 years ago that you said that. Are you so all-fired ignorant that you don't realize that she needs to hear that every now and then? I love you. I cherish you. You are my life. That you need to say that, if that's what you feel on the inside, you need to say that to her. Every once in a while, you need to say that to her so that she'll be assured that that's the way you feel, that it is important that you say these things to each other, that you just don't think about it and never say it to each other. And uh, I've had, you know, and, and so it's just these little tiny things like this. And see, this is what the law of the tongue is about. It's about us realizing that this is a vital tool of our life and that we need to pay attention to this and that what we say toward good or bad really has a tremendous effect on people and it can be a tiny little, what a, what a, what a spark a great fire kindles. I mean, like a tiny little spark can set a forest on fire. A tiny little poison can kill millions of people. A tiny break in a, in a dam can open a flood that will just mutilate everything. It, it, and, and this is a realization that we make as God's people to be aware and careful of what we do with this tiny little organ. Uh, it, it says, uh, uh, the scripture says, to be, it says, be swift to listen, slow to speak, and slow to wrath, which is a prescription. If you will be listening and not speaking, then it, it, you will be slow to get angry. If you are swift to talk and slow to hear, then it's going to make anger much quicker in your life. And the reason that we get angry so quickly is because we talk more than we listen. And the more we talk, the more angry we become. Right, the, in a multitude of talking comes the potential for great anger. And, and, and you realize this to be true because the more you talk about something, a lot of times the more fired up and angry you get about it and and you end up saying a bunch of stuff that, you do, that you're sorry that you said and you really didn't mean to say it. You don't want to say it. I mean, here, I, I'm, I'm a perfect example of, of this. I, we joked about it this morning in the message. But, but I'm telling you, I can get fired up on some stuff. And the more I talk about it, the worse I get. And, and I, see, and, and the, the, point of, the point of this law is to recognize this is for you to be aware of this and to realize that this is very important. And think about it. Think about how often when you get angry in a split second, you, op you allow yourself to say something that you're sorry that you said it. But once you say it, you can't put it back in here. You know, it's like putting toothpaste back in the tube. Uh, uh or it's like trying to put feathers back in a pillow that you've you've ripped the case and and you've blown it up to the wind and the feathers have blown to the wind and there's no way for you to get all the feathers back into the pillow again. You might be able to get some of them, but you can't get all of them back in there because you've already exploded this bleh, out of your life and 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 you've you've hurt somebody because you let your anger get out of control and you said something in the heat of the moment that you shouldn't have said, that you're sorry you said, that you wish you hadn't said. And I know we can't be perfect in life, but the law here and James here is saying, 
be aware of this. Don't let this get out. Bill, you want to say something? Okay. That is a good statement. Tongues do not have erasers. Back to like Wednesday night. Yeah. Because anything that happens with me, but Wednesday night is a family kind of like Right. It is a family, Wednesday night. Right. To me, that's one of the things that the Bible means when it says, do not forsake the gathering of God's people. The assembly of the... Because he knows we need that. Right. Because the world is beating you to death. And any time you can get with a group of people that love you, yep. it's such an encouragement. Yeah. And you know it's true, you know. And so, to me, that's, you know, I've heard people say, well, they go every time the Lord is over. <laughs> Appreciate that, brother. See, there's a good word. So, See, I'm that just blessed me. See, I'm, well, I appreciate that very much. It is. Jesus is right there, yeah, he is. He's right there in the in the midst of us, isn't he? Let me mention to you what Billy's talking about. Wednesday night, we have prayer time. It only it really only lasts about 30 minutes because the band has to come in and practice. I mean, we, we well, here's the thing. We, we stretch it as much as possible. Let's put it that way. Yeah, as long as, right. as, long, as, long as our praise leader lets us, we will, you know, what, really, actually, we just stay in there. Uh, right. <laughs> Don't put it on you. Um, she, uh, you know, really what happens is, there's probably, what would you say, 12 to 15 roughly, uh, on most occasions about 12 to 15 people. Uh, but everybody's invited. Now, you can come and you can become a part of it. It's, it's not a closed deal at all. It just, has ha- right, it just has happened that these 12 to 15 people are the ones that almost always come. And uh, occasionally there are others that drop in here and there. But I'm going to tell you, if you really want to be a part of something every week that has the potential to be a tremendous asset to your life. Let me just invite you. And I mean, nobody's sitting there going, okay, how can I manipulate this person by saying this? I mean, nobody's motive, nobody's motive is to try to take advantage of you. We don't take an offering, so, so there's no money involved. <laughs> Uh, we don't, we're not sitting there trying to con you into being something or giving us something. I mean, we don't want anything from you or, or we're not trying to control your life or, or make you do anything. It's just an opportunity for the Lord to uplift you and to allow others in your life to bless you with some type of observation. And believe me, nobody's sitting there going, okay, what can I say that's good? What can I say that's good? It's just a natural environment where you get to know people. You get to hear their hearts. You get to, they talk about things that we need to pray about for them. And so you get to see into their soul and into their heart about who they are and what they're concerned about and what, and and their mouth and and the tongue is used to um, put forth a, a, a fountain, a fountain of their life. And, and, I, and I'm used a lot of times to bounce off of that with some point, theological or something that God might say. And it's just a natural, it's like, it's just funny. You, you need to come and just see how it is. And, and it, it's just a natural flow of a conversation among 15 people or so that, that God is just moving in and out of. It's just swaying back and forth. And, and, and it's a prayer meeting where everything we say is a prayer. It, it, it's, it's not like we all come to the altar and kneel down and we start praying, Our Father, thou, thou, thou that sittest above the sapphire seal of the great throne of God. You know, I mean, it, it's just a normal spiritual conversation among people whose hearts are seeking God and want to know God. And every word and every thought is led by God's Spirit to, to, 
to speak to all of us and communicate, and it's back and forth like that, and back, and it's just a wonderful thing. And and you need, yeah, it could be the best thirty minutes of your life. Uh, and it, it right, it happens every week like that, and it, every week. You know, may not be completely dedicated totally to you, but all of a sudden, out of the blue will come something that I, one week that'll just like Deborah said or Billy said or, or uh, Virginia said, you know, um, Jackie said that, man, this will be something that just boom out of the blue, the Holy Spirit will say something to you and it'll just be like, oh, whew, whew, you know, and your life will be affected by this. And that's the way the Holy Spirit works works and that's that's the law of the tongue that's the law of the tongue right there and so this is vital to us and realize that you have that kind of power so don't hold it in when it's uh something that can bless you know realize okay I, this is the way i feel but uh, i don't want to say it yeah 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 say it say it because god wants to use it and and if it's something that's going to be negative or hurtful or harmful or Guard it, you know, put the, put the clamps on that thing. Shut those, shut those ivory bars. Keep the thing back there. You know, keep him back there. Keep him out of, you know, flapping back there because you have the power to do this. This is a member of your body. Uh, so you have the choice about it. Virginia, did I see your hand up? Right, and this was at, this is at work that this it just at work, yeah. yeah. I know how much stress can be towards people, and you know, there's times that they'll be like, "Great job, guys!" Like right after a ride, and it's yeah. So you. Burn, bacon. Oh my <laughs> goodness! You burn. <laughs> you burn the bacon. That's almost the unpardonable sin right there. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> oh my goodness! I'm not sure that can be forgiven, but we'll. <laughs> We'll say that that's good. Yeah, that's good. Great. And, uh, and it's a response. And, you know, a lot of times you feel like, man, that's just not me. I'm just not like the positive type Pollyanna person. Uh, who said? Try it. Try it. Be positive a second. And, and realize, uh, you know, it's not a, you're not trying to con anybody. You're not trying to flatter somebody. You're not trying to gain an advantage over them by the use of deceit and so forth. You don't have no ulterior motive in this. You don't want anything from them. You're not trying to get money or, you know, buy their happiness or whatever. You're, you're just being used by the Lord to speak something that might affect someone's life or the way they feel about themselves for the kingdom of God. It's great. That's, that is unimaginable. That you're about like me. That's hard to imagine. But until, until we started coming here, I had a hard time telling somebody that I didn't want to be in the church or something. That's hard to imagine. Yeah, like you had an ulterior motive. Yeah. <laughs> God brought you out of a lot of stuff, didn't he? Yeah. And I don't have a problem now telling everybody how good God has been to us. And see, that, right, that's the law of the tongue. Right, that's the law of the tongue. And see, the Holy Spirit has done that inside of you. It's not been, no one has set out to change you. I mean, God has changed you because of the environment that you've placed yourself in. And I'm going to tell you something. Because you guys have been so faithful, this is why God does. I mean, you put yourself where you could, where you could grow like that. You know, I, I, you hear me a lot talk about magic. You know, there are a lot of people that come to church, and they're looking for magic. Uh, they want a, a great relationship with God. They want it right now. Like walking in those doors, there's like dust that gets sprinkled on you, and all of a sudden, you're a totally different person. No, it may take years. It may take months. It may a faithful 
you putting yourself in the environment, you choosing to discipline your life so that you'll be here on Sunday, you'll be here on Wednesday, you'll be here on Sunday night. If you want your life to change, put yourself in a position where it can change. I mean, God has lots of tools. Listen, anybody can walk in this church on Sunday night and sit here and be a part of this and can grow toward the Lord and the Lord can speak things into their life that'll change them and that'll matter and change their way of thinking and acting and being, the way they look at themselves, the way their life grows. Everybody in this church can do that. But why aren't they here? Because they, don't, they, they choose not to be here. And they choose not to be here because they don't evidently think it's important enough to be here. So their life is going to just kind of meander on the same way. Maybe they'll hear something else on Sunday morning that'll matter. Maybe the, the few times they're here, God will say something to them. We hope it, they, that he does. We hope. But the more you're here, the more the odds go up that something is going to be said to you. I mean, you, Lawrence and Bev have been in every one of these classes. Man, these, Lawrence and Bev have been with me for 14, 15 years or more. They've been to everything I've ever said. Uh, seriously, they're like my mom and dad almost. My mom, my mom went, my mom, every time I preached while she was alive, my mom passed away at 79 years old. About, about eight or nine years ago, she passed away. She's 79 years old. Every time I ever spoke in my entire life where I was close enough for her to go, no matter where it was, in a revival meeting or anything, my mom's sitting right there on about the first row. She heard everything I ever said. Uh, same, same with Lawrence and Bev. Ever since I've met them, every, I mean, Sunday morning, Sunday night, classes, you know, uh, journey meetings, uh, life groups, everything. They've been right there, heard every word. And I guarantee you that there's nobody in this building that's changed more than Lawrence and Bev have changed. Totally, I mean, from the inside, totally different, totally different people. Not that they were anything wrong with them before, but God has just so enhanced their lives and so changed them to be different than they were to the great, you know, uh, use of God. And same thing with many of you. Many of you are in the process of that very same thing happening. Why? Because you have chosen to place yourself in a, in a place where God can influence what you think and what you say and what you are and use other people to encourage you and bless you, to know you, to be there for you. When something's wrong, man, somebody's going to notice it and they're going to say, look, you know, uh, you need somebody to help you. Let me, here, I'll be there. You know, I'll help you physically. You know, I'll move your furniture. I'll, I'll come help you, you know, do this. I'll cut your grass. I'll, I'll take you to, make, to that appointment. I'll make sure, you know, if you need some resources, hey, let's, let's, get, let's get together because this person's really in trouble, man. We need to help. I mean, how does that happen? That doesn't happen by accident. It happens because of choices that we make to put ourselves into lives. And, and what's the definition of insanity? To continue to do the same thing and expect different results? Well, if you don't like what's happening, change what you're doing. I mean, don't think, okay, I can do the same thing I'm doing now and everything's going to change. No, it's not. You keep doing the same thing you're doing now. If you don't like it, it's not going to change. You got to you, you put yourself in a different place if you don't like what's happening. Right. Understand enough, grow it, have grown enough to the point that you're seeking the Lord. You are, it's just like what you've been saying. Mm -hmm. You're allowing the Lord to work in your life, but you, you got to want this. You have to come out saying, Lord, what is it you want me to do? Mm -hmm. Right. Right.
Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I'm not a cursing person, so I wouldn't say it that way. Right. But I, up came out, and that's and I thought that was right. My my point being, I thought that was okay because I was telling the truth. Right. The Lord, the Spirit of the Lord, has worked with me through that point because when I came down here, I was like that. Right. <laughs> you know, I, I, I know would, it. Pastor would sometimes get on me because of the way I <laughs> say things. Mm-hmm. The truth, but it's just how I say it. Mm-hmm. And so the Lord nicely have taught me that you can say the same thing. Uh-huh. It's just how you say it. My intentions are in thinking about the other person, well, how would they accept that? Or, or I don't yeah, right. say that. Right. I find myself doing that more, Pastor, because of my training right. and teaching that we've had here right. and all these different classes we've had mm-hmm. in general. Right. We are more aware of being aware of other people and yeah. how the Lord has worked with us. He has taught us. Right. He's teaching us to be like him. Right. That's exactly because right. He wouldn't say that. He, don't, if, if you don't think the Lord is going to say it, don't say it. Right. If this wouldn't be something that you think the Lord would say, then don't you say don't it. Don't you say it. Yeah. My thoughts when I first came to Mississippi <laughs> was that I ain't got no time for folks playing around. They got to come to the Lord, and I'm going to tell them. <laughs> yeah. No matter how, right. it came out. Right. I, you know, and I was, I'm a good girl, so it right. didn't come out. <laughs> right. You did. I just looked. Right. And so through the years, it started off like that in the past. Yes, you did. Yes, yeah, you did. But through the years, and I've had good Christian training. I know it. Yeah, you've been brought up. You know, through the years that the Lord has touched my heart, right. touched me. Right. And I, and, and I, I, a lot of the time, I wasn't even aware of the touch. Right. But I know there's a change, and, and so now I, I, I think more. Right. Than I speak. Yeah. Because I want to be sure that this would not hurt anybody. Right. Yep. I'm saying that I'm one of God's people and I come to you a certain way you're going to think that's how the Lord if you didn't know it. Right. and so if I'm going to project that I have to be careful yep. I have to take it out of right. and so because of that because the Lord whoops me all the time he said now would I have done that he <laughs> yeah. whooped me yeah. <laughs> and he whoops me and I have to come to him and say well, Lord I'm coming yep that's right, and you know the the thing about that is there's no more truthful person in this church than Lawrence is. Lawrence is one of those. If you don't want to know, don't ask him, because he'll tell you he'll tell you the truth. And I'm serious. I mean, really, about anything in life, uh, I have found this to be so true. I mean, even stuff about himself that's negative, stuff that you know you would, if it was you, you would you wouldn't tell, you know. <laughs> But he will because he's such a truthful person. And but and, and the thing like Bell was saying about telling the truth, well, the Bible teaches us to speak the truth in love. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, that in love part of that yeah. is the most difficult thing to do yeah. Yeah. because it's easy to speak the truth if you don't care mm-hmm. how, it, how it's going to be received. Mm-hmm. But to speak the truth with love in it is you you have to uh, plan what you say. You have to listen to the Lord and, and let the Lord give you a strategy of how you're going to say this in a way that's going to be a blessing rather than a curse to somebody's life. I mean, you, you, you can tell the truth, man. You can just open up and bleh, you know, and kill somebody with it and it not be a blessing whatsoever. Or you can say it in a strategic way and say the same thing to them but, but it comes across in love and not anger or hostility or whatever. And the Holy Spirit uses that 
to lift somebody's life rather than to destroy them. Now, this is the law of the tongue. See, everything we're talking about. It, we've spent an hour and a half on, on one point, on one point. We got nine more of them, but we got, we've spent an hour and a half on one point about the tongue, the law of the tongue. And everything that we have said is exactly what that is about. And that's why it's so important to know this. Everybody in this room now has some concept of the fact that I need to focus on what I say to people. I need to ask the Lord to give me an opportunity to, to be a blessing and not a curse to someone, to speak the truth, to speak it in love, to pay attention to whether these words are salt water or fresh water, whether this is going to guide them in the right direction. Don't be careless about the way I speak because I can set their whole life in a positive way or a negative way with one little sentence in life. So, you know, know that, I mean, don't, don't get so fearful that you, you, you know, you get paranoid about what you're going to say, like, oh my goodness, I'm going to kill somebody. No, you know, just, but just be aware that you, you have a responsibility yeah. Yeah. because you are a child of God to represent your father. I mean, it's like, it's like, you know, with me, I mean, because I have an influence as being your pastor, what I say to you really matters. And if I say something positive to you, then it's going to bless you. And you're going to say, oh, my pastor believes in me. My pastor said I could do this. And man, and it's just going to be an uplift to you. And on the other hand, if I criticize you or belittle you in some way or be nonchalant and just say things that, you know, the devil can use to discourage you. He'll definitely do it. I mean, I can just be, you know, I can be nonchalant and casual and not paying attention and I can just, you know, off the top of my head say something that I don't mean it a certain way and then the devil can beat you up with it and say, oh, you know, pastor doesn't believe in me. He didn't think I can do this, so I'm sorry. I'm not worth anything. And, I, and the devil can convince you of that. So just be aware that it's that vital. And this one another stuff about the Scripture when it says encourage one another, lift one another, pray for one another, bear one another's burden, laugh with those that laugh, uh, weep with those that weep, that we, that we all have a responsibility to each other to be used by the Holy Spirit to matter and that we can be great instruments of blessing to other people's lives that God wants to encourage. It's like, how is God going to talk to you? I mean, he's going to, he's going to like be a little bird that flies in your window and says, hey, you know, this is how I feel about you. This is what I need. No, uh, you know, is it going to be thunder out of heaven that he says, you know, this is God. And I, and no, what's he going to do? He's going to use people's voices. He's going to like, sometimes when I talk, that's God talking to you. Sometimes when you talk, it's God talking to somebody else. And we can all be the voice of God because God inspires us. That, like the Wednesday night thing, we sit around and we come in and we just say, man, hi, what kind of week's it been? And then somebody will just start talking about, man, this has been a tough week or, or I've had this on my heart or this is what, something that God is, I, I want you to pray with me about this. And we just sit around talking and we will talk to each other for 30 minutes or however long until Pastor Tanya comes and runs us out. We will talk. <laughs> Not really. She, <laughs> she's, she's, part of the, she's part of the group. But what, start, what happens, we start seeing some of the band members come in out there. And we say, uh-oh, it's time, you know. And, uh, and then we'll start racking them down. And we might spend five minutes actually with our heads bowed and our hands united in formal prayer, so to speak, and the other 25 or 30 minutes, we're just sitting there talking like, like friends and people, and, and we're, but we're sharing our heart. We're sharing 
a request. We're sharing thoughts and, and all of that's praying. I don't know why we think to pray, we got to get in some formal posture and get, you know, like uh, some spirit of, you know, our thou art the highest in the sapphire seal of heaven. I mean, you know, that that's praying and, and everything else is not. No, I'm telling you, when you get in a group and a spiritual sharing and all that, everything you say is a prayer. Sometimes your presence is a prayer. You can walk into somebody's hospital room and you may not say very much, but the fact that you're there is a prayer. You are the prayer. When you walk in, your presence is the prayer that's prayed. You may not even say over a sentence or two, but, but it, it lifts the spirit. It, it matters. It says something. It says, this person cares. I'm here. And, and you don't have to. The formality of everything is not what is important. It's what the spirit uses to say through you and, and be through you. And sometimes your presence is just is a prayer that it just uplifts the whole. When you walk in, all of a sudden, the whole tone of the room changes. Peace walks in with you. Encouragement walks in with you. Strength walks in with you. You know, uh, blessing walks in with you. And you are the prayer yourself. And so, you know, we just have to kind of understand that our concept of some formatted structural words we say is what prayer is and the rest of it is just jabber. No. I mean, we're spiritual people. We represent the kingdom of heaven. Jesus Christ lives in our heart. The Holy Spirit walks in our life. And the way we talk to each other and what we say to each other and the spirit that revolves around us and lives in us is affecting everything with one another because the Holy Spirit in you recognizes the Holy Spirit in me and the Holy Spirit in me speaks to the Holy Spirit in you and the Holy Spirit in you receives the Spirit of God and there's an interaction and an interchange because it is the Spirit of God that understands what you need. It's, it's the Spirit of God. You don't know what you need. You don't know what your purpose is. You don't know the direction God wants you to know, but the Holy Spirit that's in you knows all of that. He, the Holy Spirit in you knows what the future for you is, knows what you need. It's God in you that knows all of that. And so it's responding and it's leading and it's guiding. And that's how our lives are affected. That's how our directions are affected. That's how our existence and, and, and that's how our encouragement and what we become and what we desire and what we want you know, you get in the presence of hungry people, you're going to be hungry for what they're hungry for. They, 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 they fling a craving on you, you know, and, and they inspire you and they motivate you. And you come in here flat as a flitter and down in the dumps and everything else. And somebody, the Holy Spirit and somebody recognizes that and, and says one or two little sentences to you. And all of a sudden you walk out and, and, and the same issues are waiting on you when you walk out that door as it was when you walked in the door. But you have changed. And so the way you face those things is not the same way you faced them 30 minutes ago. Now, all of a sudden, a different you walks out there to face those issues, and they're the same thing. Nothing has happened. There's been no magic that has changed everything, but you've changed. Something in you has been encouraged to look at life in a different way, to think of yourself in a different way. I'm a champion, man. God's using me. They said, they said that I mattered. They said they thought I was great. They said... I can do this. They did it. I can do it. And now you're encouraged instead of discouraged. And that's the way the Lord uses us. And that's why it's important that we know each other, that we have a relationship with each other, that, that uh, we can be used to influence each other's life. And that's why God puts us together. That's why God called you here. That's why you're, you're in this group. That's why I'm in this group, because the Holy Spirit put us here so that he can blend us and use us all to encourage each other toward godliness and greatness in life. And, and, and at life group and men's group and women's group and prayer meeting and church and, and journey and everything else, it's all used to make a difference in our life. And it's not just because you're taught well. I mean, you need to be taught well. And, and, and that's why God's given you a pastor. That's why 
you've give, been given uh, 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 things like this and, and instructions because God wants you to know and grow and understand. And if you'll commit yourself to it, he'll change you through stuff. But it's your choice. You, you, you're the one. Nobody's going to get you and drag you out here and all that kind of stuff. You're going to have to to do it and be a part of it. But he will be faithful to do what he said he will do if you'll, if you'll commit yourself. And, these, and, and we'll learn you. We'll know you. And, and then we can matter to you. I mean, you're not just strangers off the street that bopped in here and nobody knows you anymore. Now people that know you and people that relate to you can have an opportunity to impact you. And you will grow, and you will change, and your life will change. And the things that you admire in other people will begin to be true about you. And you will become somebody that's capable and productive, and your life will begin to turn around, and your dysfunction will begin to, to change, and, and your life will change. And that's how it happens. It's not magic. It's a working of the Holy Spirit of God over a period of time through the discipline of your life that God intends for your life to have. And, and so anyway, that's my assorted rambling. So there you, <laughs> there you go. It's time to go, y'all. You know that. So does anybody else have any kind of observation or question? We've covered one whole great point, the law of the tongue. <laughs> you know, at this rate, we're never going to get out of this thing, do you? Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Right, right. There are going to be, um, Billy just said, you know, if you put people on the defense that you've lost them, that they're not really listening anymore, they're, they're being challenged, and now they're trying to defend and think of all that. Uh, you're going to, and I promise you, some of, these, some of these points to come are going to talk about some things like that, the law of salt and other things like that. You know, basically, he'll say to you, it, it, you know, every you can say whatever you want to say if, to anybody if you put a little salt on it. You know, <laughs> it makes it more uh, uh, palatable. You know, just before you say it, sprinkle a little salt on it, and it tastes better. You know, and all that. So you'll learn a lot of great tools and so forth in the other nine of these things that we have yet to go <laughs> in the law of the tongue. See. A tongue is a powerful tool, man. It's, that's why I said tiny but tough, man, tiny but tough. And uh, very critical, very critical to our influence in our life. Think about this with your children. Think about this. Don't let these words just fly to your mouth. It doesn't mean that you can't ever be tough. It just means you have to, you know, be tough with, a, with, a, with observation. You know, be tough with a strategy about what you say and how you say it. And, you know, because what you intend to be a correction can be used by the devil to beat somebody's life up and you not even recognize it. So pay attention to what you do and say. And, you know, I mean, I, I doubt whether... Anybody in this room besides me, the perfect one, of course, but could <laughs> could always say what's right. You know, I mean, you're gonna mess up every now and then because you're just human. What can I say? You know, but uh, but be aware. You know, be aware. Yeah, Brian. Yeah, my yeah, anger. If you. Right. That's right. Go, go. Separate yourself. Count to ten. Do whatever it is or whatever you need to do to get yourself under control. Let the Lord speak to you. you say to the Lord, I don't want to mess this up. I don't want to just speak because I've got my feelings hurt or I'm mad about something. So let me ha have a second. All right, Lord, tell me. Speak through me. Uh, now let me go back with a little perspective, not just bleaking out, you know, with somebody on this thing. I think that's why we have the reminder of a verse where we just need to hold breath and explain the words. So I'm going to mess it up. Just help me out. Thank you. That's good. You're doing good. A harsh word speaks, uh, stirs up wrath. A, a kind word, you know, is well spoken, yeah. Yeah, a kind word accomplishes its purpose. You know, I mean, a kind word is intention. 
And a harsh word, the, the, when, you, when you speak gently, it accomplishes its purpose. But when you're harsh or angry, it's just going to make matters worse. And think about it. When you get mad, it makes somebody else mad. And then they get mad, and they blur back. And then you get madder. And then boom, boom. And then they get more mad, and you boom, boom. And then it turns into a rage and argument instead of something positive. So it, you know, it stirs up wrath. Uh, but gentle words are, are slow to, to bring wrath in life. Listen twice as much as you talk. And when somebody else is talking, you quit talking. Well, now I'm getting into other issues. All right, let's go.